Hello, and thank you for joining us for our Finnovate webinar, Turning Identity Verification into Competitive Advantage. My name is David Penn, Research Analyst with the Finnovate Group. Today, we're going to hear from leading experts in the digital space who are going to delve into how digital lenders, fintechs, and even incumbents can leverage digital technology to ward off inefficiency, drive the best possible customer experience, and enhance the speed and cost-effectiveness of the onboarding process. Specifically, we're going to learn about the landscape for digital lenders in Europe, the need for increased security, how leading companies are leveraging digital ID verification to bring on more customers more quickly, and how digital processes are helping firms cut compliance costs while boosting efficiency. Joining us today are Lex Sokolin. He's the Director of Fintech Strategy, Global Director of Fintech Strategy, rather, and partner with Autonomous Research. He's a futurist and entrepreneur focused on the next generation of financial services. Again, he directs Fintech Strategy Autonomous Research, a global research firm for the financial sector, helping clients understand and leverage innovation. Covered themes include robo-advice, blockchain and the crypto economy, artificial intelligence, chatbots, neobanks, and banks as a platform, insuretech, and regtech. Also joining us today is Joe Blumenthal. He's Vice President of Identity, EMEA, for MyTech. He's long been actively involved in online identity and risk management field with 15 years plus experience in entrepreneurship, international sales, and marketing in the field of Internet technology and SaaS. In his career, Joe has successfully founded and managed two businesses, which still exist to this day. As VP of Identity for EU for MyTech, Joe is responsible for setting the strategy and continually driving growth for MyTech in digital identity verification across Europe. And we're going to begin this morning with Lex. So go ahead, Lex. Take it away. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm very excited to walk us through uh, the European digital lender market. As part of the uh, work that we did looking at the space, uh, we did an industry analysis uh, to understand more broadly what Europe looks like across uh, digital lenders, neobanks, um, and other uh, players, um, and then try to understand what role uh, digital identity solutions as well as uh, digital KYC AML and onboarding and processing played within that. So um, I'm excited to go on this journey with you. Uh, but of course, compliance disclaimers are unavoidable, and so here is ours. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start with um, the description of the digital model, and it's hard to talk about the digital model um, without also understanding what's happening more broadly in the financial services ecosystem. These things are deeply tied together. They're symptoms of the same underlying change, um, and so we'll touch on what that is. Number two is we'll talk about um, Europe in particular and how uh, digital lenders have evolved and, and changed relative to the rest of the globe. Um, and place it into the context of the overall industry. Number three, we'll talk about um, some uh, challenges to the, to the lender model, and, and of course those challenges can also be opportunities, but in particular what role the cost of capital plays um, and what that means for having to be leaner and more productive. Um, and then number four, how efficiencies and operations and onboarding and client acquisition become even more important in that type of climate. So with that, first, let's just think a little bit about um, digitization. And I, uh, my guess is that many folks on, uh, on the webinar that are listening are familiar with digital banks and digital investment advisors and lenders. Um, but it's, uh, let's pull that apart a little bit. So the first dimension is to think about the front of the industry, the distribution or the customer relationship. So that's um, who is actually talking to your customer. And then on the back of the industry, the kind of the manufacturing part of it is who is actually underwriting or making your financial product, whether that's a banking product or an investment product or a lending product, somebody has to actually take the capital risk. And then all the stuff in the middle kind of the middle office of the industry, which is going to include workflows and data aggregation, um, and certainly identity verification as part of that. So um, that's one dimension, is just splicing the industry. The other dimension is understanding how the automation is happening. So on the one hand, you might have a human process, like filling out some paperwork or, or answering a questionnaire, turning into a machine process where that is done automatically. 
And then number two is human intelligence moving to machine intelligence. So think about artificial intelligence and neural networks being used, again, all across the client stack or the underwriting stack. And so what we highlight on this page is that for digital lending, you have all of these um, attributes checked. Uh, there are uh, automation tools, whether top-down or bottoms-up in uh, customer conversations and onboarding. There are automation tools and artificial intelligence underwriters for actually making the product. Um, so digitization is going across the entire stack of the organization. And as that's happening, um, Europe is experiencing meaningful venture flows into financial technology, um, and certainly a big part of that is the digital lending theme. So if you look historically, the last few years, let's call it about 500 uh, to 700 million in uh, digital lender venture capital, um, and certainly this year is on pace, as you see, projected to become uh, more and more funded. Uh, so there is continued investment into the space. Um, and then when we look at the investment by uh, stage, we see that the stages are maturing. So the types of companies that were funded in the early two, uh, 2010s um, have now transitioned to being uh, much larger, much more mature. So that hot pink color is showing you checks between 100 million to 500 million into these companies. And of course, the, the um, IPO funding circle is another symptom of the same thing. So more capital is flowing in, and the, the companies themselves are more mature. Um, and then when you look at where the capital is going today, uh, it is primarily the UK, um, although almost 50% of it is going into the continent. Um, and that is a change over time, uh, and also relevant for the rest of um, the rest of the presentation where we'll see actually how this compares to underwriting volumes. But I think we're familiar with the UK being a leader in digital investment, um, but it's also very notable that um, Europe, the continent, is starting to see comparable amounts of capital flow in as well. When we look at traditional banks, um, they are also highly involved in the space. Of course, we know uh, Goldman Sachs and Marcus offering both uh, digital loans, personal loans, as well as um, digital banking services with almost a 2% uh, annual interest rate. Um, the, the key there is they get to use their own balance sheets, and they've done that for over $1 billion in, in, in originations for retail customers. We've also done a survey of the top 50 banks, many of them based in Europe, um, to understand what features their mobile apps have. And what you'll see highlighted is that um, three features re related to digital lending um, are used across these mobile apps. 40% uh, uh, of the apps in our survey had uh, consumers able to get information about loans and insurance. 25% uh, uh, were able to get mortgage information, and then 10% uh, were actually able to uh, start the origination and the underwriting process and get access to credit. So it's both uh, fintech startups, which is what the venture vector will tell you about, and it's also traditional um, incumbents that are, that are involved and driving the space. And increasingly, the line is blurring between um, who, is, who is a startup and who is a bank. So that should give you a flavor for kind of the ramp up into what the market looks like. Um, and it's, a, it's quite an encouraging market, um, especially in, in Europe. Let's talk a little bit about figuring out how, w what are the economics, what are the dynamics, and how big um, it can really get. So the first point is, is, is actually, it was very difficult to size the European market because all the different geographies are quite different, um, and the approach to product is different, and the, the uh, cultural base is different as well. Um, but at a high level, top line, uh, we sized the addressable market for digital lenders at 
$150 billion uh, in origination, so that's annual volume, or about $450 billion in outstanding debt, right? So the, the level of, uh, of debt that we think uh, digital lenders can aspire to replace or refinance. And so let's pause for a second in terms of how to think about what this market is. Um, the very first cut is to think about what are the products. So we included in the products uh, student lending, which is um, uh, you know, quite bespoke to uh, Americans, and in the U.S. Um, that's a, it's a very big slice of the overall whole, so it was important to keep that in there. Uh, consumer, so this is a personal lending, uh, personal loans, whether it's refining, refinancing a credit card, uh, or even for uh, particular projects where you have credit built into the product itself, um, you know, house remodeling or medical supplies. There's um, a, a broad swath of things that goes into uh, consumer lending, and we try to bundle as many uh, customer-driven uh, small, um, small tickets as we, as we could into this category and still be consistent more globally. Number three is um, auto financing. Uh, so that, that comes with the purchase of a, of a vehicle. Um, and then number four is a small uh, enterprise, small and medium enterprise, uh, so small businesses. Uh, this is a category in which multiple digital lenders have been built um, in the U.S. and in Asia. Um, and so it's certainly a way that small businesses um, try to access peer networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, in order to um, get financing, but again, it's, it's quite bespoke based on uh, the geography that you look at. So that is the first cut, is thinking about the product itself. Um, the second cut that you see here on the page is between the UK and continental Europe. Again, the, the data sets are quite different. Um, and so in each one of the sections, what you see is the, as the tall bars will show, uh, are the outstanding balances, so the level of debt that's available in these products, um, and then the originations per year associated uh, with these products. So that was step number two. And step number three was to say, within these buckets, how much is actually addressable? How much can actually be switched over to the digital model? Because just because uh, there is uh, a large amount in auto or a large amount in uh, credit card debt doesn't mean that it's available for digital lenders to try and refinance. Um, and so we've applied a series of assumptions based on uh, market comparisons that we've done across the industry before, um, which lands us to the following addressable market, uh, about $30 billion in the UK uh, and about $130 billion uh, in Europe. And so together, that is how we get to the 100 and, uh, 150 billion in originations for, um, for the entire continent. Okay, so how does that 150 compare to um, actual progress, where we are today? And the answer is, we're quite early. Um, and I, you'll hear me make this point several times about uh, the, both the UK and the European opportunity. It looks like the uh, progress in terms of operating, um, uh, building operating companies, as well as banks getting into the space is a few years behind uh, what the rest of the world looks like. And that's OK, because you get to take the lessons of other geographies and apply them. Um, so on the left, what you see are is the um, annual originations for digital lenders in this geography. So what you see um, getting built up from a very, very small base in 2012, 2013 of, of about a billion a year to approximately 8 billion a year across um, the products I've described um, in this geography. So 8 billion, um, right, out of a, uh, the, the overall market size is still relatively slow. It's barely 10%, if, if at all, depending on um, how you cut the timing. Um, and there is 90 or 95% of opportunity still remaining. A really large portion of that is continental Europe, um, based on the amount of outstanding debt. But it's, it's a big opportunity left. 
in terms of um, revenue estimates, so figuring out not just the volumes, but what is the what is the pool of revenues that companies have? Uh, somewhere around 400 million uh, of revenues in Europe today, uh, we think are uh, generated by this activity. Um, that's a market again that we think can be a multi-billion-dollar revenue market, and certainly has opportunity to grow. In terms of um, some product uh, comments, I think this is interesting uh, to, to think about from a cultural perspective. Um, there's a lot more uh, invoice financing and commercial real estate debt that we saw uh, being packaged through P2P lending in, um, uh, in Europe. Uh, this does not really exist to the same, uh, to the same degree in other places. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, student loans, um, just they're, they're not privatized. They're uh, a, a public offering. Education is, a, is more likely a public offering in the European geography, so uh, the student loan category just hasn't been um, meaningful here and probably won't be in the short term. Okay, so um, I called out a similar chart before, which I think is super interesting, which is um, take the breakdown of the European countries um, and see where the venture capital was going. So if you remember, I said about 55% went in the UK and then about half, 45% uh, went to France and Germany and other, other locations. In terms of marketplace lending, this is totally not the case. As you can see, um, more than two-thirds, 70, almost 75% of all originations, or about $6 billion um, uh, per year, is happening in the UK. And so here we see a clear asymmetry between the funding and then the operating progress, which uh, to me signals that the left side of the chart is going to continue to grow. Um, or is that we're going to see more of that coming in in the future. Uh, another way to think about it is to say, actually, um, maybe that's not going to be alternative financing. It won't be digital lending per se. It'll just be digital banking. Um, so you might see players like Nordea or uh, Santander and BBVA who have very, very strong innovation arms and um, digital offerings come in and take that opportunity. Um, and in all these cases, we think the software that helps do KYC AML, onboarding, servicing of these relationships, um, that will be consumed both by the FinTech startups as well as by the incumbents. And so just to round out that point, um, if we look at the uh, market map for um, this geography, we split it out again kind of conceptually into the product segments, which is the horizontal dimension. Right on the left, you have more business-oriented uh, loans or enterprise. And then towards the right, we have more consumer-oriented lending um, and then kind of mix of these things in between. Um, and then on a vertical di dimension is the exactly the point I was making earlier, which is that you will have traditional banks who are digital incumbents, and of course you will have startups uh, going after this space. Um, the, the way we've also split out the startups or thought about the startups is that some of them are going to be taking the credit risk, some of them will be contracting away the credit risk, um, and then any other particular product you can imagine and permutation of a product plus business model you can imagine will be tried across these different geographies. So this is a great sign because complexity shows there's different types of things that can be uh, possible. Um, and I think, uh, again, this is a cross geography. It's not just specific to the UK. OK. So we've talked quite a bit about um, the ramp up in funding, the lag for Europe, and the ability to learn from lessons in other geographies. Um, then we've talked about you know, how big can the market be? Is it real? Where's the opportunity? Um, and so now I want to touch a little bit on um, the operating issues and the economic issues associated with this market, which will, will show you how software and digital identity plugs into making this a reality. And th this isn't a, an easy story. It's, it's actually quite, um, uh, quite complex and interwoven. So um, 
to give you a framing of how people thought about digital lenders, if you call it three, three to five years ago, the sale was to venture investors and to consumers is that operating expenses for a digital player are just going to be way lower, right? So you see that 2% for lending club versus 6% for a bank. And this is because internal processes are better, um, it's digital first or it's mobile first and so on. But what's happened since 2018 is that's become more important than ever. And the reason is that there's another cost within the digital lending model, and that cost is the cost of the money being lent out, the cost of capital. And so for a bank to lend out its own balance sheet at 200 basis points, 2%, is way cheaper than what it costs Lending Club uh, or Funding Circle or any others to accrue the different individual investors or institutional investors, and that's where you get that gap. So when the product actually comes to the consumer, it's very much equivalent. You get the same, uh, similar type of pricing in terms of percent for these lending products, um, which creates a lot of pressure on the operating model to be efficient um, and to scale. Which, um, as you see in this exhibit, there's actually quite a bit of evidence that the scale is possible, that um, you are able to keep up um, even though the cost of capital is harsh. So on the left, what you see is uh, the, the cost that goes into originations and servicing of the loan as a percent of the originations themselves. And you see Lending Club and On Deck, and we could pick any other, uh, any other examples kind of showing a similar path. And you see that um, there is a, a downward trend and then kind of a settling around 80 basis points as percent of the cost. So that's gone from $200 per loan to $100 per loan. Um, and then within identity and KYC AML specifically, um, those costs we've seen based on different examples go down anywhere from 40 to 70% um, relative to their traditional counterparty. Um, and then if you look at operating expenses overall, so you go even broader, um, comparing Lending Club to something like One Main Financial, again, there's a uh, 30 to 50 percent uh, higher operating efficiency using the digital model. And of course this makes sense. This is good news and it makes sense and it's how the world should be. I mean there's no reason for um, operating in any other way uh, at least in, in 2018. So when we look at the workflow for, um, for originating a loan and managing it, right, starting with um, onboarding the customer figuring out KYC AML, making sure that 25% of your prospects don't drop due to friction, to the next step of doing the credit analysis and getting the full profile of the customer and their full financial picture, uh, to getting that information in front of an, a decision maker that can, a, a committee that can make the underwriting decision and say go or no go, um, and then process that according to compliant procedure, all that stuff could take anywhere, depending on what your uh, product is, anywhere from two to six weeks. Um, and of course, it, it ranges and is asymmetric in that range, but it can be multiple weeks to get through the stuff if you are still using paper and if you still don't know your customer in an algorithmic way. And then number two is your monitoring and the management of your portfolio risk is also very expensive and uh, requires quite a bit of attention in operating capital if it's not done in a, in a software approach. So when we looked at the digital version of this, um, across multiple examples, timing just got massively reduced uh, to a few minutes rather than a few weeks. Of course, there are issues in terms of integrating these different solutions and different pieces. You know, how do you integrate identity verification with uh, artificial intelligence-based underwriting with a, uh, a real-time risk management system? These are more difficult questions, uh, but the LEGO pieces are there and they're certainly in place uh, to make it faster, much more functional, and a much better customer experience. And this is something I want to spend a little more time on uh, because there's a financial element to it, which is that 
Customer experience isn't just how nice your customers feel or you know, how likely they are to say good things about you on Twitter. Um, it's a customer acquisition cost. And we looked across various products and financial services from digital lending to acquiring a credit card customer to a checking account to an investment account. And it's pretty much the same answer across uh, all of these different financial products whether you're trying to sell somebody a loan or a bank account, um, the, sort of the least you're going to pay is 200 or 300 per account over the lifetime of trying to get this customer in. And you can pay as high as $2,000 per account, which is um, quite nuts. I mean, you, you would do this for mortgages and for much larger high net worth um, individuals, but nonetheless, that acquisition cost can be quite high. Um, another data point to think about that is the cost of a financial lead, something you might buy from Zillow or Lending Tree or another aggregator, um, and those range anywhere between $10 and $100 or 10 euro and, and 100 euro. Um, and if you think about the likelihood of converting a lead into your product, again, you get to that 300 to 1,000 type number. Um, another data point to support the same number is the acquisition of ClearScore recently, which is a uh, credit scoring system where the transaction, the, th the $300 million transaction priced each user within the app at $60, $60 a user. So what are we driving at? What we're really driving at is that the cost of customer acquisition is really the biggest barrier for fintech startups and for traditional banks going through the digital channel. And being able to optimize the funnel of acquisition is massively valuable. So if you can get rid of drop-off, if you can get rid of a 10 or 30% audience drop-off because your KYC process isn't good or because it's confusing or it's asking questions that customers don't know how to answer, if you're able to get rid of those extra screens and pieces of paper, you're far, far more likely to lower that customer acquisition cost in addition to that, the competition is doing it. So uh, there essentially is no choice uh, but to in, put in digital tools in order to handle this because um, all the neobanks and digital lenders um, have to put, uh, already have done this or are putting this into place. And then if we look at um, the value of this in aggregate to, to further understand kind of the sizing of the identity pie, um, in banking, which would include lending, uh, in Europe alone, it's a, a 500 million uh, revenue pool uh, dedicated just to identity. And so I, we think that you know, globally, it's um, uh, several billion dollars worth of, um, worth of value that digital identity solutions uh, generate, which of course is, a, is a, um, only a segment of the value they deliver to the industry, which would be an order of magnitude for that. Um, as a fun aside, we also found uh, what it would cost to get identity information on the on the uh, the dark web, right? So to, so to purchase it in bulk from hackers, uh, and um, you can see financial services information is actually really similar to the three hundred uh, to two thousand dollar ballpark that I gave you before, right? With online banking details and PayPal details going for literally the same price. Um, so again, not only is, it a, is there a value to uh, making sure you get identity right, uh, but there's also a security aspect to it because somebody else is willing to pay in order to compromise your process, and uh, there's a, a, real, a real cost and market to not doing that. Okay, so we've gone super fast through a number of key issues. Um, thinking about the digital lending market and how it connects into operating efficiency and identity. So just to uh, hit the main point, uh, again, there is a growing and healthy uh, venture investment market uh, in Europe specifically for this, 800 million or so. Um, half of it is in the UK, but the rest is in the continental Europe. Within the, the whole pie, it's 150 billion uh, in originations as an addressable market. Uh, we think we're just getting started 5 to 10% in terms of actually penetrating that market. So the 8 billion in current originations, which are growing at a 60% CAGR, um, 
are very encouraging, but we think there's more room to do that. In the digital model, there is, in this expansion within the digital model, there's a 50% uh, reduction in origination and servicing costs. Depending on how lean you were before, that can go up to 70 or down to 30, but generally speaking, that's fair. And then specifically within uh, customer acquisition and onboarding, um, especially at the point of KYC AML, uh, there is another 40 to 70% reduction in cost uh, that we saw across multiple examples that you can get out of smart solutions um, that help your customers uh, join you and uh, do so in a, in a painless way. So let me pause there. Uh, hopefully that gave you a, a good introduction to both digital lenders, the investment in the space, uh, and the opportunities for improvement going forward. Thanks very much, uh, Lex. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Blumadal. As you heard in the introduction, uh, that was very interesting, Lex. And I can imagine uh, folks on the webinar will have questions. So please feel free to uh, to ask Lex or myself any questions. We'll try to get back the, back uh, to you at the end of uh, of uh, my piece of the presentation. Um, I'd like to switch gears here and see um, what technology is available today to unlock some of the value that uh, Lex talked about. Uh, he has um, uh, shown us that uh, there's a lot of value in uh, digitizing the process, and MyTech is a global provider of identity verification services. Uh, being NASDAQ listed and with offices across the globe, we're often characterized as the trusted partner for financial service providers. And there really are s several drivers to the rapid growth of uh, the digital IDV solutions that um, Lex just talked about. And what we see is that the digital transformation is key to the success of incumbents uh, and new market entrants. Um, uh, if you have outdated or manual processes and digitizing them, uh, it's becoming, digitizing them is becoming really critical to cutting the costs and really to drive the growth for the new lenders out there. Um, and these processes, the digital processes and the smoother experience they offer are what uh, are going to allow the lenders and the fintech startups to compete and to compete with the traditional lenders. Um, but on the same side of the coin, uh, the larger lenders and financial institutions are aware of the need to make the move to digital. Lex talked about that. Uh, and they stand to benefit from some of the potential very large cost savings uh, they can automate uh, in their legacy processes as well. So, so that's the drive for the digitization. Um, if you look at the economic efficiency, Alex pointed it, this, this out, uh, anytime you add a screen, anytime you add friction, um, your KYC process is prone to a drop-off. Um, we've seen that in real-life examples, uh, drop-offs well above 50% are not uncommon. Um, so offering a quick and a cost-effective way for con customers to identify themselves uh, is very much key uh, to onboarding as many prospects as you can. Um, and uh, we saw in Lex's presentation how much it costs to get somebody, a consumer, to your front door, anywhere from 200 to 2,000 euros or dollars. Um, and throwing that away is, is a pure waste. Um, and obviously, there are the regulatory challenges, specifically here in Europe. Um, the compliance costs are, uh, are, uh, are going through the roof, really. If you look at uh, uh, updated regulations, the AML D4, 4.1, 5, PSD2, GDPR, uh, all their own requirements, some even slightly conflicting, uh, and all have to be addressed, uh, both in the physical channel, but similarly in the digital channel as well. Uh, and that really is a tough puzzle to figure out. Um, and it requires a complex and costly overhaul of the identity and really also the authentication service and technology uh, the FIs are using. Um, and um, both the front and the back office really, really need to uh, meet all these compliance needs. Uh, and uh, digitization and uh, technology out there like MyTech offers uh, can can really help uh, improve. Uh, 
And then there's the expectations. Um, the economy is changing dramatically. We all expect to instantly be able to um, onboard ourselves or to rent a car, uh, uh, rent a room. Um, so these UX demands are also on, on all the traditional red tape process. So uh, again, the digital experience, uh, if you do it well, will allow you to reach more customers uh, and also in a more cost effective manner. So if you look at Mobile Verify, that's a MyTech product. Um, really, MyTech uh, wants to be able to bridge that gap between um, the physical uh, um, source of an identity or identity credentials uh, and be able to use them in the, in the digital world. Um, and uh, that means that you should be able to buy from a provider like MyTech two things. Uh, you should be able to buy uh, a tool that will allow your end user to capture a really good image of an identity document and potentially a, a, a biometric like a face, a selfie, to be able to do a selfie check. Uh, and on the other hand, once those images are available, you'd like to um, be able to verify that document and or outsource the verification of the document and the face uh, and get a really quick and uh, reliable answer back. And ultimately, I mean, again, it's decreasing the abandonment. Uh, it's onboarding more of the good customers uh, because remember 99% of the people out there are genuine and they just want to um, interact uh, for good reasons. Um, and you need to meet the regulatory requirements um, uh, and, and, and the way forward is really replacing those augmented and outdated models there. So if we look at those two parts of the circle in the previous slide in more detail, um, we offer a tool that's called MySnap. And MySnap is a very robust uh, tool used by 80 million plus uh, consumers every week. Uh, and that is geared towards capturing the best possible image of the document presented in the circumstances that it's in. So if you look on this slide on, on the left-hand side, you see what happens if you don't have a tool that helps the consumer. Uh, obviously, you'll get uh, images that are uh, too dark or too light or, or not straight, so we can't see the corners of the image, which are relevant to a verification, um, or they might just be simply too far away to actually see the details on the document. And then in integrating and implementing something like MySnap will help the user capture a good image. Uh, so there's two things happening. The image quality improves, uh, and on the other hand, it's become much easier for the user to capture the image. For example, MySnap, in our case, both in native and web, will capture the image automatically. So once we've got that image, um, what do we look at? How do we verify a digital version of an identity document? Um, built by our in-house and, and, and really doctorate level science team, um, uh, we have a border control level of identity verification available. And we look at multiple elements of a document that we can see in the image here, some of the areas that we would be specifically interested in, obviously, the um, document structure. We'd be looking at all the data on the document to see if that's, uh, uh, if the comparison, once, once we lift the data, all adds up. Um, there's a machine readable zone on a document like this in the image that allow you to travel around the world, but also it has to comply to specific standards that we can check as well. Any uh, good document will be uh, uh, have all sorts of security elements on there. They can be uh, security elements like watermarks, holograms, microtext, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all of that can be verified by uh, MyTech services. Um, we know what the signature to, should look like. We know what the portrait should be uh, protected by, really. So the image on the document with your face on it uh, isn't isn't there. Uh, um, uh, uh, is covered with uh, uh, security elements that can be verified as well. So there's, there's a whole raft of uh, elements, security features, data points that we look at when, once we've got that image. And you can understand why it is key for uh, a service like MyTech to have a high quality image uh, captured so that we can uh, run the verifications properly. Now, how do we, how are we future proof? Um, 
uh, there's, there's, there's three ways that we uh, uh, continue to improve our services. Um, we have a huge number of documents running through our systems. There's a big data flow uh, running every day through our systems um, that will feed our engines based on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, as we move forward, we can see a trend from, and, and Lex pointed this out as well, from um, manual uh, supported verifications to completely 100% automated verifications. And uh, the artificial intelligence built by our uh, labs teams um, is, uh, is supporting that and uh, empowering that, really. Um, and obviously, we do have expert-level document reviewers who will help both the actual uh, verifications running through the system, but more and more now help our um, engineers develop and craft the best solutions uh, possible. And that will then uh, help us um, ultimately provide accurate, fast uh, uh, services, uh, services with a broad coverage as well. I mean, that's very relevant to any digital lender does not want to be uh, bound by the borders, let's say, of a country. So good coverage and a broad coverage like MyTech has is, is key to any solution that uh, you might want to uh, uh, acquire. All right, so now that we are familiar with the technology, um, I'd like to show some of the verification use cases that we see. I have two here. Uh, uh, Plasimate uh, is a Spanish-based um, instant financing company um, for basically for online purchases, built into e-commerce sites, uh, and also has a payment often, uh, option. Um, and in 2017, um, Spain saw more than, so sort of close to 70% of online shopping cars, uh, carts abandoned. Uh, and in fact, um, re this re represented uh, a missed total of approximately 46 billion euros. I mean, that's a, a very, very big number. Um, and to sort of capture this loss and, 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 and build on that opportunity, uh, but also to control the risk, uh, they needed to verify the identity of their customers much better. Um, and they needed to do that quickly and securely. So by integrating Mobile Verify, we, we just looked at, um, they would be able to verify the customer's identity in fewer than 20 seconds uh, and basically offer them a near instant and a, and a secure uh, financing uh, within their e-commerce purchase. For them, obviously, speed is, is, is key. Um, and taking it a bit broader, uh, a well-known name uh, to, uh, to all of you, no doubt, out there is, uh, is MoneyGram. Um, and um, it's a broader perspective, but the same challenges. And uh, uh, MoneyGram uh, needed a digital verification solution that would allow their customers to send money, uh, to transfer money online, uh, in a fast and easy way again. Um, uh, they need to comply to the KYC um, uh, legislation, uh, but also <laughs> they have a fraud department who would like to drive their numbers down uh, as well. Uh, they integrated the mobile verify solution, achieved compliance, they reduced fraud, and they onboarded more new customers online quicker. Uh, so it ticked all the boxes, um, and uh, more than 70% increase in the ID acceptance rates um, 20% reduction in fraud uh, and 80% uh, reduction in account takeover fraud. So impressive numbers there by, by implementing a mature solution that will both uh, cater for the uh, user um, experience demands out there, but also for fraud compliance AML um, requirements within, within the company. Now I'm going to pause there for a sec and um, want to show you what the product looks like in real life. So I have short videos here which I'll play for you so that you can see how a document is captured. You can see MySnap live in action as well as a face and then how the results will um, uh, be presented back basically to the end user and to our customer and that's two, two different things. So you'll see that we fire up um, the capture of a passport and intentionally this will look very blurry in your screen because there's PII 
private uh, personal information on there that we will not uh, obviously share on screen like this. But it went so quickly, uh, but this is a live ref representation of how uh, we capture the uh, information. Um, it was automatically captured. So as soon as my snap, remember that's the tool, the capture tool is happy and can see the four corners of the document and there's not too much light and not too little light, the document sharp, it'll capture, capture it automatically. Basically the user doesn't have to do uh, much more than hover the device above uh, over their document. Now looking at the face capture, you'll see that it's quite similar. Hold up the device blink, and it automatically captured uh, the selfie, as it's often called. Um, key in selfie capture, in face verification, face comparison, and really anti-impersonation check using a biometric is two things. One, uh, the capture of a good image that then can be used to compare to the image on, a, uh, on the document that has been captured earlier on the in the process, and two uh, is live learner's detection. You definitely need to uh, know that the person in the process is live so that they haven't pieced somebody else's identity together and is trying to um, uh, prove they are uh, trying to onboard themselves using somebody else's credentials. Uh, so the liveliness in our case is done in multiple ways. One is called active, where you can see the blinking, but in the background there are many more ways that we actually can determine uh, that it's a live stream there. And to wrap this up, I'll show you what the result screen looks like. Once we've captured all the information, uh, we will give back the OCR data to the end user so that they don't have to key in the information. But you can see here in the screen that there's multiple checks been done, uh, and we break that down and try to give you a risk-based model that can be translated to a decision on, 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 on your side. That's uh, basically it for me. Um, back to you, David. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Joe and, and Lex, for two very, very interesting uh, presentations uh, on, on this issue of, of digitization and, uh, and how folks can really uh, leverage that with regard to their processes. Uh, just a reminder for all of those who are listening to our presentation that this is an interactive uh, affair, so please feel free to send in your questions that you might have for uh, Joe or for Lex or for both. Um, if you if you like, um, go ahead and when you do send in your questions, if you would mark them, if you do intend them for one of our specific presenters, if you want to direct a question to Joe specifically or to Lex, go ahead and make a note of that um, in your question. So we'll be sure uh, to direct it uh, to route it properly. So we do have a few questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and get started with uh, a few of them while while others are coming in. Uh, first, we have I guess is a question of clarification for for you, Joe. And this has to do with the difference between MySnap and Mobile Verify. Is there, what's the difference between those two solutions, and are they two separate things? Yes, they are. Uh, good question. Um, I should have clarified better, maybe. So MySnap is the tool that actually is uh, integrated on the front end, uh, maybe in the mobile app, and that allows a consumer to capture a good image in the circumstances that they are in. Um, mobile Verify is the product name for the service on the back end that does the verification of the identity document as well as the comparison between the, the selfie and the image on the, uh, on the document. Excellent. Now, we're just staying with you, Joe, one more time. Um, you mentioned a couple of, of uh, challenges with regard to verification, the, the importance of liveness and things like that. So one of the questions we had for you was, what types of spoofing or fraud attempts do you often see against identity, identity document verification? Yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of them out there. We have uh, we see very good attempts uh, all the way through to very bad attempts. Often will, somebody will try to uh, open a bank account using a picture of their cat, uh, and obviously that doesn't go very far. But generally, a fraudster will try and change something that makes sense to them. So we'll see changes in date of birth or an expiry date. Uh, and very often these days, um, as, the, as the face uh, comparison uh, is becoming a bit more mainstream, we can see uh, other images being uh, doctored into the image of the document, uh, a genuine document with somebody else's face in there. So assuming from a very high level, that's the sort of uh, fraud attempts we see fly by uh, uh, every day. 
Okay, very good. And then speaking of, of high level, we do have a couple of questions coming in for Lex that are that are definitely more sort of high level overview uh, and projection sorts of questions, and I definitely want to get to those in just a second. Let me ask this one last uh, question on this area for for, for Joe here. Um, which I think is, is, is sort of uh, uh, relevant. I'm sure a lot of people are curious. Um, other use cases you've seen for ID verification, uh, or is it generally used uh, for the onboarding portion of a workflow? Are there other other ways that ID verification you've seen used effectively? Yeah, good question. We've been talking about onboarding a lot uh, today, but there are. I mean, uh, there's the re-verification triggered by by uh, an authentication. So uh, you've lost uh, your information. You need to be uh, re-verified. Uh, that's a typical one. But also think of the trust economy. So today we've been talking about regulated uh, companies, financial institutions. But if I want to uh, rent your car, I'd like to uh, be able to prove who I are, and you would want to know who I am. So in that case, uh, proving your identity by using document uh, uh, verification uh, is very useful and actually quite common as well. So there's just two of them, two of the other ones we see. Uh, we see. Excellent, excellent. I hope that that responds to that that question that the person had there. Um, let's go ahead and turn to to you, Lex, with a, a couple of questions. I mentioned um, you provided us with a really, really nice broad overview. Of, of what's going on in Europe, and uh, understandably, we had some questions uh, uh, along those lines. One of them for you is, how does the European lending market compare to others across the globe? How similar is it a story to what we see in North America or Asia, which I know is something you touched on in your presentation? Sure. Um, and um, it's a little bit of a painful story. So in <laughs> the U.S., the, the venture wave was about two to three years earlier. Um, so the models were invented there, and uh, the companies scaled up and went public earlier. So about two, three years ago, we had Lending Club and On Deck um, all go public. Um, and um, there's, there's been a little bit of a challenge in figuring out whether these are tech companies or whether they are finance companies. Um, and um, their, their valuations have come down to earth, and they look more and more like, like finance companies. So I think one of the lessons that Europe can take away from the U.S. is to be building and thinking about digital lending as a better version of banking rather than as you know Facebook with money attached to it. Um, the stories from Asia are also uh, interesting and, and quite uh, useful, um, but it's on the entirely other side of the spectrum. So Asia was also much earlier to this theme. Um, but it was uh, quite a bit more uh, community-driven. So there were hundreds and then thousands of small digital lenders that really did um, form peer-to-peer -peer networks where the fundraising came from um, individuals and invested into projects. Um, so there, there's definitely a story there about how to, how to popularize a model. Um, the downside is they went too far, and many of the lenders in, in that case were fraudulent. And so the government mm. has been cracking down on those for the last um, uh, for the last year and a half, which, if you look at originations in China, went from 70 billion a year down to kind of negative 40, um, with wow. thousands of these <laughs> platforms being shut down. Yeah. Um, so I think that example is. You know, don't forget regulation. Put compliance first in a lot of the, of the cases, because if you if you do make uh, an enemy of um, your regulator, then your whole your whole market is going to cease. Um, and I think in Europe, um, I don't think that's an issue. I think it's much more about how do you stimulate demand and how do you get these firms to take off. Mm, excellent. Speaking about Europe, and, and I know it, uh, with the recent uh, no-confidence vote that we heard about, uh, that there's quite a bit of Europe on the mind of, of late. Um, so, for let's, we had one more question for you, and, and maybe this might be our, our, our final question as we, as we close in uh, toward the top of the hour. And this is, what is the next step for the lending market in continental Europe? And what would it take to see a similar level of success like uh, the U.K. is seeing? I think that's you know that's a really tough one. Um, I would point again to the difference between the amount of venture funding, about 50%, versus the amount of underwriting, 25%, um, and point to that and say, um, you know, something's off. Either that investment has to pay off in Europe, 
uh, or there's going to be underwriting that's not being captured because it's coming from digital banks like Nordea or BBVA or Santander um, that, that have kind of digital channels, and so they're taking the role of the startups. Um, I think the there is a, a difficulty because all the regulation in, in every country is slightly askew and different, so you have to jurisdiction shop um, and figure out your product. And then there are cultural issues around um, where businesses and people are used to borrowing from. So, uh, for example, a lot of um, uh, corporate debt in Europe is from banks, not from private lenders the way it would be um, in the U.S. And so I, we're starting to see that transformation in some product lines, like I mentioned invoice financing. and uh, But you do need a little bit of a cultural change and a marketing uh, approach to get people familiar with the SASA class and be comfortable with it and interested in it, right? So the very first place is that you know, somebody in, uh, in Spain or in Italy or in Germany has to say, uh, I would like to hold a P2P digital loan in my investment portfolio. And for that to happen, that has to be you know, marketed and offered to the public at large, and they have to sort of understand that. So I think that's a surmountable obstacle because it's happened in all, all these other geographies, but there's definitely uh, a consumer education component. Excellent, excellent. Again, we are running uh, about out of time. We're coming up about four minutes to go, but we did have one question that, uh, that came in late that's, uh, that's pretty relevant, and I, I believe this is probably a question for Joe. And uh, it has to do with uh, with MyTech on mobile. Um, the question is, is MyTech just done on mobile? Can it be done by uploading photos to PC using a PC webcam as well? Yes, it can. Yes, we, we, we offer omni-channel solutions. Uh, we've Im implemented uh, multiple uh, uh, channels, basically, with, with enterprise companies. Uh, and obviously, they should be able to offer uh, their customer the channel of choice. So wherever they are, whenever they are, they should be able to uh, prove their identity. And uh, yeah, we do have solutions for, for all of the ones you mentioned. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for that for that response. And, and Ben, thanks for that question. I know sometimes we kind of get uh, on a mobile thing and we get off and running. And we, uh, we want to make sure that folks are, are, are aware of, of just how the technology and solutions scale. Certainly, we are not leaving PCs behind uh, by, by any no. stretch of the imagination. Um, it looks like that does uh, exhaust the questions that we have for today, so I do want to thank – it also does exhaust our time. Uh, I want to thank our guests uh, for joining us, Lex and uh, Joe, for giving us quite a bit to think about uh, today. Uh, I want to let everyone know that if you have any feedback on today's webinar or any recommendations for future webinars that you'd like us to do, there will be a short survey at the end of this webinar. Uh, it should be on your screen shortly, and if you'd complete that out, that would give us quite a bit of guidance and feedback for the future. Um, also wanted to let you know that uh, after this uh, webinar, you will get an email uh, with a recording of the webinar, so you'll be able to go back and, uh, and check in uh, anything that you might have missed or just to hear some, some more details uh, again. And last but not least, wanted to let everyone know that the Finnovate Europe Conference is right around the corner. Uh, for those of you particularly interested in FinTech and innovation in Europe, this is an event certainly to keep, uh, to keep in mind. We'll be coming back to London February 12th and 14th for three days of live FinTech demos and deep dives into topics very much like those discussed by Lex and Ben today. So for more information on Finnovate Europe, please visit us at Finnovate.com. Once again, thank you all for joining us very much today. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Goodbye, and have a wonderful week.